Welcome to Love and Money Secrets TV. I'm your host, Dame Lillian Walker, and today we are diving deep into breaking the habit of becoming yourself. <music> Chapter five, so let's get started. Survival versus creation. So in the last chapter, I purposely used the example of my writing to illustrate my point about transcending the big three. Because when you write, you are creating words, whether on the physical page or in a digital document. The same creativity is operating when you paint, play a musical instrument, turn wood on a lap, or engage in any other activity that has the effect of breaking the bonds that the big three hold over you. So why is it so hard to live in these creative moments? If we focus on an unwanted past or a dreaded future, that means that we live mostly in stress in survival mode. So whether we're obsessing over our health, the survival of our body, paying our mortgage or the survival for need for shelter, our external environment, or not having enough time to do what we need to do to survive, most of us are much more familiar with the addictive state of mind will call survival than we are with living as creators. So in my first book, I went into great detail about the difference between living in creation as opposed to living in survival. So for a fuller explanation of this difference, you may want to read chapters eight through 11 in Evolve Your Brain. I'm going to briefly outline the difference between the two. So think of survival or think of life in survival, survival mode as picturing an animal such as a deer contentedly grazing in the forest. And so now let's assume that it's in homeostasis in a perfect state of balance. But if it perceives some sort of danger from the outside world, let's say a predator or its fight or flight nervous system you know, will obviously get turned on. So this sympathetic nervous system is part of the autonomic nervous system, which maintains the body's automatic functions, such as digestion, temperature, regulation, blood sugar levels, and the like. So to prepare the animal to deal with the emergency it has detected, the body is chemically altered and the sympathetic nervous system automatically activates the adrenal glands to mobilize enormous amounts of energy. So if the deer is chased by a pack of coyotes, it utilizes the energy to flee. If it is nimble enough to get away unharmed, then perhaps 15 to 20 minutes when the threat is no longer present, the animal then resumes grazing its internal balance is restored. So we humans have the same system in place. When we perceive danger, our sympathetic nervous system is turned on and energy is mobilized and so on in much the same way as the deer. So during early human history, this wonderfully adaptive response helped us confront levels of threat from predators and other risks to our survival. So those animal qualities served us well for our evolution. Thought alone can trigger the human stress response and keep it going. So unfortunately, there are several differences between Homo sapiens and our planetary cohabitants in the animal kingdom that don't serve us well. Every time we knock the body out of chemical balance, that's called stress. And the stress response is how the body innately responds when it's knocked out of balance and what it does to return back to equilibrium. So whether we see a lion in the Serengeti or bump into a not so friendly ex at the grocery store or freak out on the freeway because of traffic or because we're late for an appointment or a meeting, we turn on the stress response because we are reacting to the external environment. So unlike animals, we have the ability to turn on the fight or flight response by thought alone. So and that thought doesn't have to be about anything in our present circumstance. 
we can turn on that response in anticipation of some future event. So even more disadvantageous, we can produce the same stress response by revisiting an unhappy memory of the past that is stitched into the fabric of our brain's gray matter. So either we anticipate the stress response producing experiences that we recollect or we recollect them and our bodies are either existing in the future or in the past. So to our detriment, we turn short term stressful situations into long term ones. So on the other hand, as far as we can tell, animals don't have the ability or should I say disability to turn on the stress response so frequently and so easily that they can't turn it off. That deer will go back to its happy grazing, isn't consumed with thoughts about what just happened a few moments ago, let alone uh, you know, the time a coyote chased it two months ago. This kind of repetitive stress is harmful to us because no organism was designed with a mechanism to deal with negative effects on the body when the stress response is turned on with great frequency and for long durations of time. So in other words, no creature can avoid the consequence of living in long-term emergency situations. So when we turn on the stress response and can't turn it off, we're headed for some type of breakdown in the body. When we have long periods of stress like this, I think a lot of times you see people who, I've always said for a very long time that whatever the weakest link in your body is, whatever the weakest organ, whatever predisposition to um, weakness and either a, it could be a system, it could be an actual organ or a group of organs, whatever that weakest part in your body is so that the energy is the weakest there. So you get the least amount of energetic flow there that is where your illness is going to manifest. So a, a common thing that happens to people who are sent more sensitive of, of, in their solar plexus and their stomach is that they'll have a bad gut reaction, a bad gut feeling. If your stress always goes to your gut, whether it's your intestines or your stomach, then you're gonna either have sour stomach or you're going to have, perhaps you have a lot of um, gas, maybe you have upper GI problems because it doesn't just stay to your stomach. Now it's starting to go up your esophagus and your trachea. You can have, uh, you can actually have upper GI problems. For some people, instead of, you know, the, the fear gripping them in their stomach, for some of them, it takes their breath away. And so it manifests in bronchitis. It could be bronchitis, bronchiolitis, pneumonia, you know, if, if asthma, different types of things that are related to respiration. And those are all fear responses, as you know. Some other people, it could be a lower back issue, or you could even have a combination of one, two, or three or more of these. In more severe cases, you can have people that will come down with, with neurological disorders. And so it runs the gamut, but basically the root cause of all of those things is fear and how we're processing it, how we're using our body to interpret the feeling of fear and that stress response. So when we turn on the stress response and we can't turn it off, we're headed for some type of breakdown in the body. So let's say you keep, you, you keep turning on the fight or flight system due to some threatening circumstance in your life. Pause button. You know, maybe you have a perpetual problem with the IRS or maybe you have a perpetual X uh, with regards to um, spousal support uh, in either direction, either paying it or receiving it. Or maybe you have a perpetual amount of stress because of maybe the number of kids that you have and the number of kids that you're taking care of. Or maybe you have kids and your, maybe you have kids and parents that you're watching or kids and in-laws that you're having to care for or any combination of situations like this. Maybe it's your family situation plus all your employees at work. Make no mistakes, your employees are like your kids. Whether you, they're your direct employees where you own the company or if you're a manager to a company where you manage a group of people, anybody who's managed other adults 
you know, will attest to the fact that in some instances, it can be like herding cats and it can be a very stressful situation depending on the individual, their management style, and the group of individuals that you're managing. It's a combination of factors, of course. So let's say you keep turning on the fight or flight system due to some threatening circumstance in your life, real or imagined, as your racing heart pumps enormous amount of blood to your extremities and your body is knocked out of homeostasis, you're becoming prepared by the nervous system to run or to fight. So, but let's face it, you can't flee to, you know, to the Bahamas, nor can you throttle your fellow employee. That would be primitive. So as a consequence, you condition your heart to race all the time and you may be headed for high blood pressure, arrhythmias, and so on and so on. So pause button. So another thing that you can have is you can have a, a disruption of the heart where you have a dissonant, you, you, you actually have heart incoherence. It's a dissonance within your heart. So it causes arrhythmias. You can have tachycardia, which is a speeding up unexpectedly of your heart where it just keeps on beating super, super fast. Or you can have an arrhythmia, arrhythmia, which basically means that instead of your rhythm being steady, it's infrequent. So you might have go, you know, your heart might go boom, 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 and it might even flutter where it doesn't even fully beat, which is another problem with the heart. Some of that can also be anger. If, if you are someone who is constantly getting angry all the time, again, that is a negative energy. It's gonna to go to the weakest link in the body, the weakest organ, the weakest organ system, the weakest body system that you have in the body. So moving on here, and what's in store when you keep mobilizing all that energy for some emergency situation, if you're putting the bulk of your energy towards some issue in your external environment, there will be little left for your body's internal environment. Okay, pause button. One of the things that most people don't realize is that when you have that going on, that's a huge energy. It's an energy leak. So that is no different than you running around. Let's say you, you have a full meal, you exercise every week, and you are now jumping into your car, your car, you always maintain it every 3,000 miles or 5,000 miles, whatever your scheduled maintenance calls for, like clockwork, you oil, lube and filter, you, you make sure that you change the oil and you're like methodical about that. And you get a tune up every 50,000 miles or whatever your scheduled maintenance calls for. However, even though you fill up the gas tank, and let's say you're supposed to get 300 miles to the tank, but unbeknownst to you, you have an energy leak. And where is that energy leak coming from? You have a hole in your gas tank. Depending on the size of your hole, you at the beginning may not notice the energy leak, but as that energy leak grows bigger, you'll notice that, oh, instead of getting 300 miles a gallon, I'm only getting 275 miles now per tank. Wait a minute, I'm down to only 250 miles. Instead of getting full three, you're losing 50 miles a tank. Well, that's what these energy leaks that we're talking about right here. When you have anger that gets lodged in the body, that's unresolved emotion, that's like an energy leak. So now your body, is continuously running that anger program, even though you're not really conscious of the anger program any longer, but it's still burning energy. And so you're wasting energy there. Same thing, if you had some sort of big altercation, let's say that you went through a breakup. You went through a massive breakup, whether it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, whether it's um, a marriage of whatever amount of years, it's a breakup and you, it was a very um, unexpected, um, very hurtful. I don't know what break, but breakup isn't painful, but let's say it's, it's been more than six months and you can't, can't seem to move on. And you have not chosen 
to forgive that person and to just get on with your life. You're just, or maybe you experienced the breakup and then you immediately went into denial mode. It's like, nope, I'm not going to feel pain. I'm not going to feel sadness. I'm not going to feel grief. I'm not going to cry. So you just bottled up all those emotions. And so now you've suppressed, repressed, and depressed this massive energy. And so it's like right here. And so it might be manifesting in digestive problems. Could be. You could get have GERD, gastrointestinal reflux disease. You could have shortness of breath. Maybe you're starting to have, you know, some sort of pulmonary acting up energies because maybe for you, your, your lungs are, or maybe your strong is real stomach. You're real strong. Your stomach is real strong, but maybe your lungs are your weakest point. It just depends on the person. Uh, maybe, maybe your liver starting to act up. So maybe you're starting to have, and you're not even sure you feel a deep pain, but you're not even recognizing it as a liver pain. You just think it's a deep stomach pain. Maybe you've been drinking, tipping the bottle a little bit, maybe having, maybe you used to only drink socially and now you find yourself either drinking beer every night or whatever, whatever kind of liquor, or maybe you're doing liquor and some sort of over the counter medication to calm your nerves, to lower your anxiety or nervousness, or maybe it's not over the counter. Maybe it's some sort of illegal drug that you're using to calm your nerves, like marijuana, any combination of things. You're doing everything but facing those emotions. Well, that energy has to go somewhere. It's gonna to continue to ricochet in your body until you resolve those emotions. So whether it's attacking your lungs, whether it's attacking your stomach, whether it's attacking your actual nervous system where maybe you're starting to get carpal tunnel syndrome, or maybe you're starting to feel like the toes in your feet or maybe two of them or three of them in your feet or your hands are starting to get numb, or maybe you're, you're feeling um, sciatica. I mean, it can manifest in all sorts of different ways. Maybe, um, maybe you've now been, a, you know, officially diagnosed with mus mus you know, multiple sclerosis or it, I mean, there's no limit to, to this. So I'm just letting you know what happens and what you can do to counteract it too. If you've ever found yourself, and this is one of the things that I learned also with Dr. Not only just Dr. Joe, but Dr. David is yeah, Dr. David Snyder, he is the one who brought it to light where, you know, all of us have been in a circumstance where, especially those of us who, if you're really sensitive, like I was, I still am very sensitive, but I've learned to cope better now, but I was so sensitive that I had to bottle everything up. And so for years I bottled things up. Well, that doesn't go without consequence. So now you have realized, okay, I can't be ignoring all this stuff. This isn't healthy. But one of the things that your body will do, because Dr. Joe always says, thoughts are the language of the brain, brain and emotions are the language of the body. So I'm gonna repeat that again, and I'm gonna decipher for you what that means, because the first time I heard it, I was like, oh, what? What's exactly, what does that mean? So thoughts are the language of the brain. So your brain is the organ that verbally, verbally interprets and vibrationally and frequency interprets every thought, feeling, action, or emotion that you've ever had, whether it's conscious or unconscious. The brain is simply the organ mechanism that is used to, to file all that away, to retrieve it, and to filter through whatever it is that you're experiencing now. So you could be Every time you get into the car, you might always be wearing dark shade glasses of, oh my gosh, I might get into a car accident if you've had multiple car accidents before, as an example. Or if, you, you've had, um, if you're a serial relationship person, and let's say you've had you know, 20, 30, 40 relationships, and they all last six months to a year and a half, but never more than that. And that means that every time you get into a relationship, you put on the sunglasses of, you know, they're dark glasses that 
the expiration date is six months to a year and a half. So every time you get into a relationship at the six months to a year and a half point, you either you self-sabotage, you do something to make sure that that doesn't go beyond that six month to year and a half mark, because that's what your brain has recorded and you've never bothered to unpack that energy and release it and let it go. So let's go back to the example of a breakup because that's something that I had to go through twice in the last 10 years. So what your brain does, and Dr. David Snyder talks about this, where you'll be driving. And let's say you've repressed, depressed, suppressed those emotions because you don't want to deal with it. You don't want to suffer. You don't want to have pain. You don't want to have grief. You don't want to cry. You just want to bottle it up. You don't want to deal with it. You're just in denial. So what happens is that you'll be driving your car and you'll be all happy. So as far as you're concerned, you think you're having a great day and by all means you are having a great day. And so remember thoughts are the language of the brain. Feelings are the language of the body. So your emotions, any emotion that you've had, good or bad, but the bad ones, the sad ones, the grief, the anger, the rage, the sorrow, the extreme sadness, shame, guilt, frustration, those are emotions too. Those, if you don't digest them, they get stored into your body. And you, it's gonna keep on, your body will bring them up to the surface for you to deal with them. And if you don't deal with them, you press them back down. They're like, okay, well, now is not a good time. We'll have to deal with this later. So you'll be driving your car and you're happy and you're thinking, oh my gosh, today it's so awesome. I'm gonna go paddle boarding. Um, you're getting together with a couple of friends and you're like, I'm gonna have so much fun. And maybe you go out and you have a great time and now you're you're like oh my gosh today's been so awesome what an awesome day gosh that food we had was so fantastic the conversation was great gosh we got to do that over again and you're driving home and now you're just in a place of satisfaction and then all of a sudden the thought of that breakup and the ugly emotions start to bubble up it's almost like it's percolating and it's starting to bubble up and you're like oh no hell no you're like i don't want to deal with that now and your body's like wait a minute you're relaxed now this is the perfect time to to bring it up so then the thought bubbles up again and you're like oh no that's an unpleasant thought i don't want it to ruin my day so boom you press it down again and then the body goes okay well that didn't work so we're going to have to catch her when she's not driving in such a good mood. So now you get home, you do whatever it is that you have to do. You jump in bed, you do whatever your routine is. You put your head on your pillow and now your body goes, okay, she's not thinking of anything. This is the perfect opportunity. So now your body goes, okay, let's, Now's a perfect time. She's not thinking of anything. She's relaxed. She's in a neutral state. So then the thoughts and the memory of that breakup of that day and all, and maybe your body might even tremble. It doesn't necessarily have to tremble, but all the ugly emotions of that day start to surface. Maybe you even get teary eyed. Maybe you actually get a little chuckled up and you go, nope you bottle it down again. Okay, your body is going to repeatedly with more force because you have exerted more pressure to suppress it down. Every time you suppress it down, it takes more energy for you to suppress it down. It is sucking the life out of you. It is a weight on your shoulders, but you are unconscious to the fact that you have un, I call them undigested emotions. Now, I don't know of anybody else who talks about emotions in terms of digestion, but for me, that is the most accurate word picture I knew when I was dealing with my stuff, when I have dealt, when I deal with my stuff, I see it as a digestion of emotions, just like you're digesting food, you're digesting energy. It's time to be a grown up and take responsibility for 
the whole of who you are and say, okay, you know what? It's bedtime now. No, there really isn't a bad time. There really isn't a good time. You know, when would now be a good time to take care of digesting this stuff to unpack this? Now, I don't want to keep carrying this. I don't want to have this energy suck. I don't want to feel drained. And this is bubbling up. That means I need to deal with it. Anytime you have an unwanted thought like that bubble up, the best time to deal with it is the moment that it bubbles up so that it doesn't keep on haunting you and surfacing its ugly little head at inopportune times. There's nothing more inconvenient when you're in the middle of a business meeting or you're in a pleasant situation and now you have that thought, it's like a nasty, smelly, it's like somebody passing gas, you know, a burp in reverse. When the gas comes out the other way, it's like, well, that's what those thoughts and those emotions are like, but it's your own stuff. You need to unpack it. So the best thing to do is say, okay, and you just, you can talk to yourself. Okay, Lillian, this is the time I'm here by myself. It's time to go to bed. I'm willing to let all of this come out. I can do the ugly cry. I'm going to feel, I'm going to allow myself. I'm going to give myself permission. What would be better yet is for you to get out of bed and go to your mirror. Stand in front of your mirror. Look at yourself in the eye. Look at yourself in the eye. Preferably look at your left eye. Why your left eye? Because your left eye is your personal side. Your right eye is your public side. That's the eye that deals with how you want the world to perceive you. But your left eye, that's your private personal eye. So look at, you, look at the true you in your own eyes. Look at your left eye and talk to yourself. Say, okay, right here, right now, I'm willing to deal with this right now. Let's bring it on. Let's bring all those emotions up. I'm willing to cry right now. I give myself permission to be sad. I give myself permission to be angry. I give myself permission to be fuming, pissed, um, livid. Yes, you didn't like, you felt betrayed. You felt slighted. You felt demeaned. You felt manipulated. You felt deceived, lied to. Whatever the things are, you start to unpack them and say, that's right. And then allow yourself to feel those emotions. You're not going to die from it. Contrary to what I thought, that you could die, that you get, get so sad, that you could get so angry, that you could die. No, you're not going to die from this. In fact, you're going to feel much better when you're done. And allow yourself, give yourself permission. Say, I give myself permission to cry. And you may have to close your eyes after you do this. It might even behoove you to sit down and do a little writing exercise and write down every, everything that you feel, everything that you thought that was unjust, that was unfair, that was um, very callous, that was insensitive, whatever, whatever it is, whatever it is that's bothering you, just write it all out. Write it all out and then go to your kitchen and get a steel pot. If you have a fireplace, it's even better. But if not, a steel pot will do. If you have stoneware, use stoneware. And then just light that piece of paper on fire and say goodbye. Now, in my experience, the times that I've done this, it's kind of funny how energy works. Because normally, <laughs> this is weird, but normally paper, you know, you light it and it, it lights up and it burns right away. A whole sheet will go pretty quickly. But words have energy. And this energy is so, it's like a sticky tar because, and I'm only speaking from personal experience, because I chose to suppress, depress, repress those emotions for so long and I wouldn't deal with them. Just you know, it's me writing that on the piece of paper. So I'm putting the energy of thought as I write it, as I'm writing it, I'm seeing it, as I'm seeing it, I'm feeling it. 
that vibration is going through my hand, through whatever writing instrument I have, whether it's a pen or a pencil or a marker, there's a lot of energy that's tied to that piece of paper. It's not just that piece of paper that's like made from wood anymore. Now it has all that vibrational energy tied to it. So it's, it's no surprise that when I've gone to burn it, it won't burn. Maybe the edge will turn on and it'll turn off because it doesn't, that energy is so like a sticky tar, it does not want to go. So you have to keep lighting it and 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 lighting it until you finally get the whole thing to finally burn up and just turn all into ashes. Now, there's a lot of science why this happens. And I just told you how there is energy that's tied into it. And you have multiple dimensions of reality as you're writing it out because you're thinking in the past, but you're in the present. As you take it from thought form, you're seeing it. You're thinking it, you're seeing it. If you're saying it out loud, you're also hearing it. You're feeling it through the sense of your hand and as you're writing and whether it's print or cursive makes no difference. Pen, pencil, marker makes no difference. So now it's going through the pen onto that paper. The paper is the recipient of all that energy. That energy is really, really charged which is why it resists you burning it up. But then you burn it up and you let it go. And you might have to do this more than once. In my experience, usually once you do that, you're pretty much home free. There's a few other exercises. I have certain processes like the neuro health reset, which you can definitely use for this. But that is part of your taking ownership of those feelings and saying, you know what, I am not gonna let the bullet, make no mistakes. Any of you who know anything about guns, you know there are, there are certain bullets that if you shoot through flesh, it'll go straight through. There is a type of bullet like a hollow point. If you shoot someone with a hollow point, it'll go in small through, through the front and in the back, it'll leave a big hole, heaven forbid. And then there's another type of bullet that when you shoot it, it doesn't go through, it doesn't make a hole through the back it bounces inside the body and it destroys everything, which is fatal. And that's what our emotions are like. It's like one of those, you can think of it as multiple energy bullets that are just ricocheting inside of you. They're waiting for you to calm down and re receive it when it bubbles up again for you to deal with your impending shift. It wants, the body wants to let go of that energy and the brain would be fine with putting that in the past. The brain is just going to do whatever your conscious mind tells it to do. And if not, it's just going to go on default programming. That's what all this, this information about breaking the habit of becoming yourself. This is all about self mastery. So you have to learn to master your own emotions. And I guess we could argue that being able to bottle up your emotions in the face of adversity, in the face of a very unwanted situation is a certain level of self mastery because you didn't allow yourself to just explode or to just get angry in that moment. You just bottle that emotion up, but you know what? You can't just end the self mastery there. Self true self mastery doesn't let that garbage, you know, I don't know about you, but if I were to keep all the trash that I create in my home and never take it out to the dumpster and let the rubbish can company take it away eventually i would have so much trash inside my house that it would stink and that's what happens in our bodies but we're so ignorant we don't know this oftentimes in some families they're pretty good about 
teaching and conditioning the kids to deal with whatever stuff as it comes up. But in, in other families, we don't have the best emotional hygiene. And we're taught to repress, suppress. And the thing is, it's like a huge weight, but it's causing all this damage inside of our body. Now, once we are aware, like right now, the person who's looking at this video right now over this camera, you're being put on notice. There's a reason. This is, you've been asking, you've been praying, seeking, and guess what? You're finding. This is one of the answers. This is one of the secrets to, to owning your power, to stepping into your truth, stepping into your power, because you are going to recapture all this energy that's been bouncing, ricocheting, causing all this damage inside of your body. Ultimately, it's going to cause a tremendous amount of disease. So the sooner you take all that garbage and say, out, this is no longer in my present. This is now part of my past. You can even command your brain to keep the lessons so that now those are jewels that you can throw them into your crown. And now that is wisdom. You will recognize certain patterns the next time so that you avoid ever doing that mistake or entering, entering into a situation that looks, feels, and sounds like that. That is not a good familiar place to go to. You want to go to a healthy familiar place, not an unhealthy familiar place. So let's move on in the book. I, um, I felt that that was really important. For me, it was a game changer, and I hope that um, it is for you too. Your immune system, oh, that's the other thing. This stuff can also wreak havoc on your immune system. It can just deplete it because, again, it's sucking the life force energy out of you. It really is a tremendous energy suck. So your immune system, which monitors your, in, your inner world, can't keep up with the lack of energy for growth and repair. That's why you get sick. That's why you get dis ease. The disease is the lack of ease in your body. But now you're smarter because now you know how to handle it. So therefore, you get sick, whether it be from a cold, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, all are immune mediated conditions. Uh, knock on wood. One of the things I'm very fortunate, my kids are the same way. We never get, we never get sick. We never get colds. We just have pretty powerful immune system. But one of the things that I've learned over my lifetime in dealing with, you know, so many people, so many, um, everything from clients to people that worked with me, worked for me, it's, it's been an amazing journey, but I, I recognize that oftentimes people who have any form of arthritis, the knots in their joints, the inflammation, that inflammation has to do with unforgiveness that has lodged itself literally in between the joints of their bones. And if that person, you know, continues on, their bones will actually get knotted up, which that sounds awfully painful, but it also is an outward reflection of the stubbornness of not wanting by any means to forgive whoever or whatever, because it doesn't have to necessarily be a who. You could be extremely upset and extremely unforgiving of an organization, of a group of people, of a government, of a city that you can't seem to get out of because it seems to pull you back every time and you're always stuck in that city. Even though you may have been born there, you may have wanted to leave and you left and it sucked you back. And so you're really, you know, your anger is hurled at that city and all of its inhabitants. When you think about it, the real difference between animals and ourselves is that although we both experience stress, humans re-experience and pre-experience traumatic situations. So what is so harmful about having our stress response triggered by pressures from the past, present, and future? When we get knocked out of chemical balance so often, eventually the out of 
balanced state becomes the new norm. So as a result, we are destined to live our genetic destiny. And in most cases, that means suffering from some sort of illness. So the reason is clear. The domino effect from the cascade of hormones and other chemicals we release in response to stress can dysregulate some of our genes and that may create disease. So in other words, repeated stress pushes the genetic buttons that cause us to begin to head toward our genetic destiny. So what was once very adaptive behavior and a beneficial biochemical response, by or flight, has become a highly maladaptive and harmful set of circumstances. Because make no mistakes, when you have that negative reaction, whether it's anger, rage, frustration, sorrow, sadness, depression, so on and so forth, you have a certain chemistry. It's a cocktail of any combination of 140,000 chemicals that our brain produces. Our body will produce up to 140,000 chemicals in order to upregulate or downregulate the genes that we have. And then that genetic code will either express or not express whatever it is that's in the blueprint of the DNA. So for instance, when a lion was chasing your ancestors, the stress response was doing what it was designed to do, protect them from their outer environment. That's adaptive. But if for days on end, you fret about your promotion, over-focus on your presentation to upper management, or worry about your mother being in the hospital, these situations create the same chemicals as though you were being chased by a lion. Worry, worry and hurry. These are the twin offsprings of fear that kind of hide in disguise in my opinion, because I think oftentimes we don't recognize that hurry is that we have fear that we don't have enough time, that we're gonna fall short in our capacity to accomplish X, Y, Z, so we hurry. We have fear of not being enough, of not meeting certain expectations, and so we hurry. I was the queen of hurry, so I know a lot about this particular emotion. Hurry. Worry, the twin of hurry. Worry is again, it's faith in, res in reverse. I know you've heard that platitude. You've heard probably plenty of people say, yes, worry is just faith in, res in reverse. What does that really mean? If you worry, that means that in case A, you believe that there's gonna be a positive outcome. That's belief or faith however you want to take it. I don't want to paint a religious overtone over this, but faith and belief are, are basically very similar. They're the same. If instead of having belief that everything is going to be fine, faith that everything is going to be fine, if instead you are worried, you're worried that things are not going to be fine, you're worried that things are gonna take a turn for the worst, that things are not gonna turn out the way you would like. If you're now focused on worry, your belief is not that things will turn out right, but that things will turn out the way you don't want them to be. So now you're worried. You're, I'm worried that it's not gonna turn out the way I want. Belief in reverse. You don't believe that things are gonna turn out well. That's an energy suck too. And as we know from everything that we've learned, if you were part of our reading, reviewing and applying of Becoming Supernatural, all 14 chapters by Dr. Joe Dispenza, the first book that we read starting about, I don't know, three weeks ago. And this book, which is Breaking the Habit of Becoming Yourself by Dr. Joe, you will know that thoughts, are powerful thoughts you can change the outcome you can heal alone by thought alone of course there's a formula which we discussed it in becoming supernatural we're also discussing it in this book breaking the habit of becoming yourself and it all starts with the thought and if your thought is worry 
whether you're worrying about yourself or you're worrying about another individual. If you're worried that your relatives are going to get sick with X, Y, Z, if you're worried that they're not going to be here on time, if you're worried, 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 worried. My family is the queen and king of worry that is in our genetic DNA. I don't know what it is about Spaniards, Italians, Jews, Portuguese, the Greeks, and all of these things. We have a corner on worry, worry and hurry, I'd say, but especially worry, worry and guilt. Those are cousins, worry and guilt. But let's stick with worry and hurry. If you are worried about family members, you are not adding a positive vibrational energy that is going to help them. And in my family system, and I don't know if you can relate with this, but oftentimes worry was a sign of love. It's like you worry about the people that you love. Well, if you really go at the root of this is like you have fear that things are not going to turn out the way that you want. And now from a higher perspective, now that we know better and we have this awareness of keeping heart centered, keeping our heart not only open, but broadcasting the energy of unconditional love in the face of that which is unwanted, I'm going to hit the pause button. I'm not going to worry. Why? People who worry, hurry, people who fear, who, people who freak out, people who go crazy, people who break out in a rage, they all continue the cycle and the motion of that which is unwanted. That doesn't work. 99% of them, 99.9% of them. I don't want the results of 99.9% .9 of all the people. I'm going to hit the pause button and go, no, wait. I'm going to be a neutral, no reaction. I am going to get into heart and brain coherence. I hit the pause button. I'm going to slow down my heart rate. I'm going to slow down my breath. I'm going to slow down my brain waves. I'm going to go into theta state. And I'm going to use my conscious awareness to command my brain to go into theta. And now I'm going to download I'm going to put into the 5D quantum realm what it is that I want instead of worry. Because worry is just going to make me go down the toilet. I know that the outcome is not a good one there. So and I don't want to worry, 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 and then be pleasantly surprised. No, I'd rather hit the pause button, create it in 5D quantum, add positive energy of love to the situation, focus on what it is that I want, and then be rejoiced that I get to do a do-over. I saw it the first time in 5D, now I'm creating it, and now I get to witness it. I don't know when, I don't know how, but I know that the order's in, so I know it's just a matter of time. And then I'll be pleasantly surprised to see it again, and oh, it's so much fun to see how even the words that I used when I created it, the people, the players, the actors that were in that 5D realm, they say the exact same thing. How is that possible? That's what you're learning here. So getting back to hurry and worry. We talked about worry about your mother being in the hospital. These situations create the same chemicals as though you were being chased by a lion. So now that's maladaptive. So we're not going to do that anymore. And the trick is to catch yourself going, oh my gosh, or oh no. Wait a minute, red flag, pause button. I'm not going to do that anymore. I don't want those results that everybody else gets. I'm mastering myself one unwanted thing at a time. We're funny creatures. We start off with mastering ourselves with one unwanted thing at a time. And then after you get better at mastering that, then you start to add, oh, I could do the exact same thing for the wanted things. <gasps> That's even more fun. And then by definition, you're an alchemist because you're taking base metal, stuff that you could usually throw away, and that base metal, you're turning it into gold that now you want. It's something wanted, something precious. That's what it means to be an alchemist. So now you're staying too long in emergency mode. Fight or flight is using up the energy of your internal environment needs. Your body is stealing this vital energy from your immune 
digestive and endocrine systems, among others, and directing it to the muscles that you'd use to fight a predator or run from danger. But in your situation, that's only working against you. You see how that energy is just taking from everywhere, like it says here, from your immune system, your digestive system, your endocrine system. You can see how your, even your hormones could get out of whack from this being in this worry, hurry, this place of dis-ease. Of course, it's going to cause disease. So from a psychological perspective, overproduction of stress hormones, that's at the root of all of this. You have stress hormones that are there unnecessarily. So now you can dissipate them, transmute them, change them into energy that uplifts you. And now you step into your power. So overproduction of stress hormones creates human emotions of anger, fear, envy, and hatred. These incite feelings of aggression, frustration, anxiety, and insecurity, and causes us to experience pain, suffering, sadness, hopelessness, and depression. Most people spend the majority of their time preoccupied with negative thoughts and feelings, and it is likely that most of the things that are happening in our present circumstances are negative. Obviously not. Negativity runs so high because we are either living in the anticipation of stress or re-experiencing it through a memory. So most of our thoughts and feelings are driven by those strong hormones of stress and survival. When our stress response is triggered, we focus on three things and they are of the highest importance. One, the body, it must be taken care of. Two, the environment, where can I go to escape this threat? That's why some people are called runners, because as soon as an obstacle, a problem, a challenge hits, they, they literally run, they flee. And the third one is time. How much of it do I have to use in order to evade this threat? So living in survival is the reason why we humans are so dominated by the big three. The stress response and the hormones that it triggers forces us to focus on and obsess about the body, the environment, and the time. As a result, we begin to define ourselves within the confines of the physical realm. We become less spiritual, we become less conscious, less aware, and less mindful. Bottom line, we become unconscious because we are asleep, we are unaware, we are unaware that we are operating just in the first, second, third energy centers, that we are in a fight or flight mode. And in anticipation of wanting to guard ourselves from whatever fear that we have of being hurt, fear of being harmed in any way, shape, or form, we are not living in the present. We're living in the past because we are predicting that we're going to be hurt again. So you're not present. When you're doing that, it's a real tough way to live. And it happens to all of us. I don't think there's a single person on the planet that hasn't experienced this. Uh, and most people, I think, don't ever catch on to that loop. And so they live an entire lifetime like that, never learning to self master themselves so that they can be in the present moment. They can recognize the mistakes of the past, harness the jewels of wisdom not forget them, but not have the past memory and past emotions no longer have a trigger on you. This is how you actually do it, not just talk about it. And then you're able to move forward, not in anticipation that the same thing is going to happen to you again, because if that's the case, then you're living in the past. No, you start with a clean slate without bringing baggage from whatever past that you've had and then you move forward, not jaded, not cynical. Because if you're jaded and you're cynical and you're sucking on lemons, that means that you're still living in the past because you're still, woe is me, pity party. Oh my gosh, this horrible thing happened to me. Horrible things happen to everybody. Unfortunately, that is part of the polarity of this earth experience while we're here in this meat suit. We have to experience light and dark, good and bad, wanted 
and unwanted, really happy and really sad stuff. It's, it's how it is here. But the, the flip side of things that are unwanted are there to show us a definition of what it is that we do want. Because when you've been mistreated, you're like, oh, wait a minute. I don't like the way I was treated here. This is not the way I want. You're able to define, okay, I don't like when I'm treated, yada, yada, yada. I, then you flip it because you don't want to focus on not being, not being mistreated. You want to be treated X, Y, Z way. So now you focus on that with kindness, love, respect, yada, yada, yada. Whatever those things are that are fun and life-giving to you. It's going to be a little bit different for everybody, you know, to have joy, to have laughter, you know, to have appreciation, mutual respect, um, respect of each other's dignity, you know, da, 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 da. That's what those points of contrast are there for, all of them. Every single thing, every thing that has happened to you. This is one of the things that I learned with, uh, I think it was uh, Neil Donald Walsh, who talked about in his book, Conversations with God. And in there, it says that everything that's happened to you has been out of love. You know, even, even especially those bad things, because those people that were doing those bad things, they may have loved to lie. They may have loved to cheat. They may have loved to deceive. They may have loved to act like you fill in the blank. They may have loved to steal and they stole from you, but it was an act of love. It's also showing you a certain aspect in the universe so that you can move forward in light of that information. You're not held hostage to that information. I mean, you are hostage to it un until you resolve and digest those emotions, but it's there for you. It didn't happen at you. It is there to, believe it or not, it's there to uplift you. And I know that does, I, I, the first time I heard that, I was like, what? How could that possibly be? And it's like, okay. And I, I was learning this all at the same time when my mentor, Bill Nasby, the late Bill Nasby, brilliant man, died two Christmases ago. And he'd been my mentor for over a decade. And one of the things that he said that the power, like your power lies in your ability to respond with ability to each individual thought, action, and motion. So when you become responsible, you become responsabled to each individual thought that you have, act, and motion. That's where your primary control lies. And I remember the first time he said that to me, I had to have him repeat it three times because I couldn't believe my ears. It was, it was so true. It was piercing. I heard it. It pierced me at such a deep level. And it's kind of like it got me in the heart first before it got me in the ears. And so I almost couldn't hear it with my auditory ears. It's almost like I heard it with my heart ears, which is, I know it sounds kind of strange, but as you move on in this, it'll make sense to you. Don't worry about it if it doesn't make sense to you. It will. And that was a huge aha for me when I started to recognize that. And then I started to have to integrate it into my being and taking responsibility for anything and everything that had ever happened to me in my entire life, good, bad, or indifferent, doesn't matter. I'm responsible for it all because I'm the one who is here creating this experience, just as I'm creating this experience with you, I'm creating this video and you are, you are watching, whether it's now or tomorrow or a week from now, two years from now, 20 years from now, it doesn't matter. We are co-creating this together, just like a button. Every button has its hole. You know, there's like pieces, everything fits, this entire universe is organized like pieces of a puzzle where things come in together. Some of them dovetail more easily than others, but everything fits together like a puzzle. So as a result, we begin to define ourselves within the confines of the physical realm. We become less spiritual, less conscious, less aware, less mindful. So put another way, we grow to be materialists. We don't stay in the potential energy waveforms. We become materialists. And as you collapse your electromagnetic field, you become more dense, more particle, less wave. 
we know what the consequence to that is. We become materialist, that is habitually consumed by the thoughts of things in the external environment. So our identity becomes wrapped up in our bodies. We are absorbed by the outer world because that is what those chemicals force us to pay attention to. They're forcing us, but we still have free will. Friends and gems, make no mistakes. Your brain and your ego will make you think otherwise. But friends and gems, once you are aware of your awareness and you become to realize and understand and know that your awareness can be focused and you can command your brain and use the organ of your brain, you are the master of your brain, you can tell your ego, I understand why you are there. You are there for definition, for clarity, for posterity, for contrast. I don't need you anymore and shut up. You're being put in time out in perpetuity. Brain, do as I say. And now you focus all of your energy on love, on your love, because that's what you're doing. You're harnessing the love that's always been there. Then maybe a little time is more than others. It's sleepy because sometimes we gave the throne to fear instead of love, but it's there. It's always, it's always been in there. And now you're just opening up your heart bigger. You're feeling more love than you ever have before. And the more you grow that love, the more powerful you become because you're standing in integrity of who you truly are. And you are accepting that power of who you truly are. And now that you accept that power, now you can start to mold the clay in the 5D quantum realm. And you can start to get those energy waveforms to turn into particles. And you get enough particles going that boom, then it turns into a 3D manifestation. So we're absorbed by the outer world because that is what those chemicals force us to pay attention to. Things we own, people we know, places we have to go, problems we have to face, hairstyles we dislike, our body parts, our weight, our looks in comparison to others, how much time we have or don't have, you get the picture. And we remember who we are based primarily on what we know and the things we do. Living in survival causes us to focus on the 0.0001%. So again, point, 0.0001% instead of the 99.99999% of reality. Survival, living as a somebody. Most of us embrace the traditional notion of ourselves as a somebody. But who we really are has nothing to do with the big three. Who we are in consciousness connected to a quantum field of intelligence. When we become this somebody, this materialistic physical self living in survival, we forget who we truly are. We become disconnected and feel separate from the universal field of intelligence. The more we live impacted by stress hormones, the more chemical rush becomes our identity. If we fancy ourselves solely physical beings, if you're just going to acknowledge just the meat suit, the container, like in this case, this container at birth, obviously it was a lot smaller. It was five and a half pounds when I was born. So that container was named Lillian. So that's what my parents named me, but that's not, that's not who I am. That is loud and clear now. And if this is the first time you're hearing that, that might sound, may sound a little perplexing to you. But I think, in fact, I don't think, I feel and I know without a shadow of a doubt, as you dive deeper into the meditations, as you really start to embrace this knowingness, you're gonna realize when you go into meditation, you're no one, nobody, no thing, nowhere, no place, and no time. Dr. Joe talks about it relentlessly. You have to be the nobody, not the somebody. You have to be no one, nobody, no thing, nowhere, no place, and no time. You become detached from the physical container of who you think you are. You're this 5D entity stuck in this little meat suit. And you're not limited to this meat suit. You are unlimited, but you need to, and to begin with, you have to close your eyes to do that. But in good time, you're gonna be able to do it with your eyes open because you will embrace and own that you are not limited 
to this 3D meat suit, that this, this is really actually a holographic projection and that the, that the true you is far bigger and greater in energy, in scope, in infinite power, infinite possibilities, infinite applications, infinite densities. Yeah, we even exist in multiple densities, different densities, different dimensions. There's all sorts of good stuff here, but one thing at a time. And you knew all of this. This is all remembering because you already, you already know all of this, but you've forgotten. And so now you're remembering the member of now your physical body is re bringing it back and going, Oh, that's right. Yeah. Cause when you were a baby, you knew all of this. And before you were born, you knew all of this because your soul has always existed. So now you're coming back to this truth. Now you're getting back into that void so that you can do both and both and not either or both and the physical you, the non-physical quantum infinite you, you're bringing them together. This is such an exciting thing to do. So we fancy ourselves solely physical beings. We limit ourselves to proceeding only with our physical senses. The more we use our senses to define our reality, the more we allow our senses to determine our reality. We slip into that Newtonian mode of thinking, which, which locks us into trying to predict the future based on some past experience. Newton, you know, all of Newton's laws, Isaac Newton, but we're not going to do that anymore. So if you recall, the Newtonian model of reality is all about predicting an outcome. It's again held to that belief that based on all these laws that you can have a familiar predictable outcome, but we know different now, don't we? So now we are trying to control our reality instead of surrendering to something greater. All we're doing is trying to survive. There's three energy centers. So if the quantum model of reality ultimately defines everything as energy, so why do we experience ourselves more as physical beings than as beings of energy? We could say that the survival oriented emotions, emotions are energy and motion, are lower frequency or lower energy emotions. They vibrate at a slower wavelength and therefore ground us into being physical, Think about that. From a physics perspective, it makes total sense because since your energy is being locked into your first, your second, and your third energy center, so your perineum, base of your spine, two inches below your navel, two inches above your navel, your first three energy centers, none of the energy is going to your heart, let alone to your fifth energy center, your voice. You're not going to be able to speak your truth, that's for sure. It's not going to your pineal gland, not going to your pituitary, and definitely not going to your eighth energy center. It's locked in the first three. By definition, your electromagnetic field has collapsed, and now you're real dense. Dense matter, which you're more heavy, which is going to ground you more, rightfully so. Once you're out of that fight or flight mode and you get the energy to move up into your heart, you open up that heart. You broadcast that energy of love. That energy has to go now up to your fifth energy. So now that you can also express your truth, that energy center now goes up. It's inevitable. It's going to go to your pineal gland. Your third eye, that pineal gland is going to start to grow the transducer because the calcium carbonite, you know, those five little crystals, they're like rhombohedrons. They start to, to shimmer until boom. The little antenna literally grows on top of the pineal gland. The pineal gland, in fact, looks like this little pine cone. That's what it looks like. And it's tiny. It's the size of a rice grain and so on and so forth. And then that's how you're able to access the 5D quantum because you can access those. You know that the atom, we know from physics, it's always in the potential waveform of energy. It's always in that state until you observe it. The moment you observe it, then it turns into particles. So now you observe what it is that you want to turn it into the particles that you want. I hope this is making sense to you all. So they vibrate 
the dense particles, they're a slower wavelength. The energy wavelengths are moving at the speed of light. The other ones are slower and they're a denser energy. They vibrate at a slower wavelength and therefore ground us into being more physical. We become denser, heavier, and more corporeal, more body-like. That's what corporeal means because that energy causes us to vibrate more slowly. The body quite literally becomes composed of more mass and less energy, more matter and less mind. I'm sure a lot of you people have felt how some people will walk into a room and as soon as they walk into a room, the room feels heavier or darker. And as soon as they leave, the room lightens up. That is evidence that their electromagnetic field is collapsed. They are very dense, dense matter, very grounded. They don't have, they're not connecting to the divine at all, at all. Figure 5a, the higher frequency waves at the top are vibrating faster and therefore are closer to vibratory rate of energy and less to that of matter. Moving down the scale, you can see that the slower the wavelengths, the more material the energy becomes. Thus, the survival emotions ground us to be more like matter and less like energy. So emotions such as anger, hatred, suffering, shame, guilt, judgment, and lust make us feel more physical because they carry a frequency that is slower and more like that of physical objects. However, the more elevated emotions such as love, joy, gratitude are higher frequencies. And as a result, they are more energy-like and less physical and material. So it might make sense to you that if we inhibit our more primitive survival emotions and begin to break our addiction to them, our energy will be higher in frequency and less likely to root us to the body. So in a way, we can liberate energy from the body and when your body has become the new mind into the quantum field, wow. So as our emotions become more elevated, we will naturally ascend to a higher level of consciousness and closer to the source and feel more connected to the universal intelligence. Now, let me correct something right now because throughout all of this, I've been talking about the divine, how I always motion up to the divine, to the source. The reality is, this is the truth and as you dive into this, you're going to know this. It's like, you don't have to take my word for it. You just know. I mean, we all have read, we've all, when it comes to the different scriptures, whether it's, you know, Christian Bible, Catholic Bible, the Jewish uh, Torah, the Old Testament, um, it talks about, even in, even in Buddhism and in other religions, it talks about how God is within us and all around us, that God is everywhere. God, God is omnipresent. But when you are doing these meditations, make no mistakes. Yes, God is not up there. God is not out there. You are going to lose the feeling, the sense of your body because you won't feel your hands. You won't feel your feet. You don't feel your body. You are lost in the void. And in that void, you become one with with God. You are an aspect, you are a reflection of God. And so that divine energy source, that infinite source intelligence, that creator, whatever, that light, you are one with it. It is one with you. And so it's not out there. It's not some guy in some place. It, it's all, it all becomes one like whole thing, whole like sphere, like infinite sphere. I hope that makes sense. Addicted to being a somebody. So when the stress response is turned on, whether in response to a real or conjured up threat, a powerful cascade of chemicals rushes into our system and gives us a strong jolt of energy, momentarily waking us up and our bodies in certain parts of the brain to put all of our attention on the big three. So this is very addictive. To us because it's like drinking 
a triple espresso, we get turned on for a few moments. So in time, we become unconsciously, of course, become addicted to the problems, to our unfavorable circumstances, our unhealthy relationships. We keep these situations in our lives to feed our addiction to survival-oriented emotions so that we can remember who we think, who we think we are as a somebody. So we think. There's a saying, I think, therefore I am. I believe that was, I think it was Plato. I'm not 100% sure on that. But it's a matter of you thinking that that's you. If that's true, then you can think a different thought and no longer be the person who's addicted to those survival emotions, no longer be the person that is unforgiving of whoever did whatever to you. You can choose to be and think you're the most forgiving person in the world. You're the most evolved, the most ascended, the most light-filled person in the world. You're the most evolved person in the world. You can start to harness and believe that you are the most connected person with the divine, with the universe, with the great, the great I am. Or you can choose to be addicted to the cocktail of emotions that make you feel awful, yucky, bad, heavy, dense, not good. And you can keep on repeating that cycle because if you do that, you're just going to attract more of that in your life. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to attract any more of that bad stuff in my life. Once is enough. Next, I'm off. I'm learned that lesson. I'm on to the next thing. So we just love the rush of energy we get from our troubles. Not me. By the way, I would much rather learn for the problems. I'd rather learn from the problems and troubles of others than my own. I am inevitably going to create whatever concoction of problems. Thank you very much. If I can avoid problems by seeing certain patterns of behavior and gleaning from the wisdom of others that have come before me, by all means, I've signed me up for that. I've, I don't, I'm not one of those people that I'm wired to learn the hard way. I know people who are wired where they have to. Doesn't matter what amount of education, what amount of reading, what amount of admonishment, advice, they just like, they only learn the hard way. They learn through extreme pain. So if that's their cocktail of choice, yeah, he or she has the free will to do that. So moreover, we also associate this emotional high with every person, thing, place, and experience in our outer world that is known and familiar. We become addicted to these elements in our environment as well. We embrace our environment as our identity. And if you agree that we can turn on the stress response just by thinking, then it stands to reason that we can get the same rush of addictive stress chemicals as if we were being chased by a predator. As a consequence, we become addicted to our very thoughts. They begin to give us an unconscious adrenaline high, and we find it very hard to think differently, to think greater than how we feel or to think outside of the proverbial box becomes just too uncomfortable. The moment we begin to deny ourselves the substance we are addicted to, in this case, the familiar thoughts and feelings associated with our emotional addiction, there are cravings, withdrawal pains, and a host of inner sub-vocalizations urging us not to change. And so we remain chained to our familiar reality. Pause button here. I used to uh, have a friend. They're no longer my friend. I used to have this friend. It baffled me the first few times I saw her do this, where we would be driving throughout LA and all of a sudden, you know, there's a lot of traffic in LA. So albeit because there's so much traffic, you get into traffic jams all the time and it could take you half an hour to get through a couple lights which I know is miserable at best, but sometimes, you know, we would be in this, you know, we're on, you know, whatever street in LA and this gal, she would swear out the guy at the corner that's just standing in the sidewalk. He's not even driving. And he's like saying, oh, he's a, you know, all sorts of bad words and da da da. And I'm like, 
why are you hurling negative energy at that person over there? They have nothing to do with the traffic. They're not even driving. They're a pedestrian. What's it to you? And then she would say, oh, it's just kidding. But she wasn't kidding. She was in a constant state of frustration and she was so addicted to fighting because she even self professed herself as a warrior, as a warrior, a conqueror. She was a fighter. And sure enough, she was a fighter. She had a long list of people later on, I found out who she had all sorts of legal battles with, a long string of legal battles. And not to mention a long, a very big list of, of relationships that were failed because she was always fighting. And inevitably, that's why we are no longer friends because she started fighting with me. And so it would baffle me that she was so addicted to her desire to fight. You know, it wouldn't matter who was next to her, to her in the car. She would honk the horn and she would pick fights with people who, you know what? They don't have wings. They can't fly over the cars that are in front of them and the cars that are beside you, you know, mind your own business. And yet she was in this constant, you know, and this was a side of herself that for a long time she kept hidden from me. But the more I started spending more and more time with her, then it started coming out more and more. And it was like, holy cow. And then she was perpetually tired. Well, no wonder you're putting out that much energy fighting with everybody. Of course, you're going to be tired. Even if the other person can't hear you, the fact that you're like hurling all this negative energy all the time, it's like, wow. It's like, that is a pretty deep unconscious state of being, you know, I hope that's not you, but if it is, you may want to start to curb that behavior. And we all have something. I, I talked about in the last chapter, I think it was, or two chapters ago, I, I talked about, you know, my having to curb certain things in my language, which was embarrassing. And it took a long time. It took like four or five months for me to curb certain languaging patterns. It's not easy. But you know what? That's again, part of the path of self-mastery. So thus, our thoughts and feelings, which are predominantly self-limiting, hook us back to all the problems, conditions, stressors, and bad choices that produce the fight or flight effect in the first place. We keep all these negative stimuli around us so that we can produce the stress response because that addiction reinforces the idea of who we are, only serving to reaffirm our own personal identity. Simply put, most of us are addicted to the problems and conditions of our lives that produce stress. No matter whether we're in a bad job or a bad relationship, we hold our troubles close to us because they help reinforce who we are as somebody to low frequency emotions. Most harmful of all, we live in fear that if those problems were taken away, we wouldn't know what to think and how to feel, and we wouldn't get to experience the rush of energy that causes us to remember who we are. For most of us, God forbid we not be a somebody. How awful would it be to be a nobody, to not have an identity? The selfish self, the selfish self. As you can see, what we identify as our self exists within the context of our collective emotional associations with our thoughts and our feelings and our problems and all those elements of the big three. Is it any wonder that people find it so hard to go within and leave this self-produced reality behind? How would we know who we are if it weren't for our environment, our bodies, and time? That's why we are so dependent upon the external world. We limit ourselves to using our senses to define and cultivate emotions so that we can receive the physiological feedback and stimuli to receive the physiological feedback and reaffirms our own personal addictions. We do all of this to feel human. When our survival response is way out of proportion to what is happening in our outer world, that excess of stress response hormones causes us to become fixated within the parameters of self. So we become overly selfish. 
So we obsess about our bodies. We're a particular aspect of our environment and we live enslaved to time. We're trapped in this particular reality and we feel powerless to change, to break the habit of being ourselves. These excessive survival emotions tip the scales of a healthy ego, the self we consciously refer to when we say, I. When the ego is in check, its natural job is to make sure we are protected and safe in the outer world. As an example, the ego makes sure we stay far away from a bonfire or a few steps away from the cliff's edge. When the ego is balanced, its natural instinct is self-preservation. There's a healthy balance between its needs and those of others. It's attention to itself and to others. When we're in survival mode in an emergency situation, it makes sense that the self should take priority. But when chronic long-term stress chemicals push the body and brain out of balance, the ego becomes over-focused on survival and puts the self first to the exclusion of anything else. We're selfish all the time. Thus, we become self-indulgent, self-centered, self-important, full of self-pity and self-loathing. When the ego is under constant stress, it's got a me first priority. Under those conditions, the ego is primarily concerned with predicting every outcome of every situation. Talking about an obsession. Because it is over-focused on the outer world and feels completely separated from the 99.99999% of reality. In fact, the more we define reality through our senses, the more this reality becomes our law. And material reality as law is the very opposite of the quantum law. So whatever we place our awareness on is our reality. Consequently, if our attention is focused on the body and our physical realm, and if we become locked into a particular line of linear time, then this becomes our reality. To forget about the people we know, the problems we have, the things we own, the places we go, to lose track of time, to go beyond this body and its need to feed its habituations, to give up the high from emotionally familiar experiences that reaffirm our identity, to detach from trying to predict a future condition or review a past memory, to lay down the selfish ego that is only concerned with its needs, to think or dream greater than how we feel, and crave the unknown, ooh, reading that again, and crave the unknown. That is the beginning of freedom from our present lives. Pause button here before we go on to the next section. The thing I was going to say, going back to what Dr. Joe says, that when we're doing the meditations, we want to be no one, nobody, no thing, nowhere, no place, in no time. When you are doing your meditations and you get into the void, you are starting with the breath and you're using it to slow down your heart rate, slow down your your breath, slow down your heart rate, you slow down your brain waves and you go into theta. And then you go into that void and you feel that shift. You are no one, nobody, nothing, nowhere, no place, no time. You don't feel your hands, you don't feel your feet, you don't feel your body. You are detached from your body. You are actually taking a journey in that 5D realm. And you are going, you are going, you don't know where you're going, but you know you're going. And then next thing you know, you are traveling far, far, far away. Sometimes you leave so far that you have you get lost. You have no idea where you went. You leave. And at some point in time, you come back. You have no notion of how long it took. But while you're gone and while you're in that realm, it's the most freeing, peaceful place to be because you are no longer your name. Like I'm no longer Lillian. I'm no longer whatever my profession, whatever it is I do for a living. I'm not my age because that is a 
it's a paradigm that's only relevant on earth it's irrelevant out in quantum because in quantum everything is existing at the same time so i am not a person of a certain age i am i'm a spirit energy being so all the constructs that we have in 3d reality that the world would normally cast upon us you're free of all of that one of the things that over the last uh what seven or eight years it's stepping away from the whole title title in terms of what you do for a living it's like oh what you do for a li it's become more complicated because i have several things that i do and i can say one thing it's like you start to also look at at what is true what is true and what is real from a more comprehensive perspective because i could just identify myself exclusively with the construct that i'm a mother and it's true i am a mother i'm so much more than a mother that's just an aspect of me on this earth plane is being a mother uh, i or i could just be i could not disclose that and i could just be a sister or i can be neither of those and i could just be a writer or I could deny all of those things combined and just be a YouTuber. Am I really any of those things? Yeah, I'm all of those things, but I'm so much more than all of those things. You are not that label. Our society likes to put a label on you so that they can take the average sum of what the, co what the majority of the people are if you're a teacher, if you're an engineer, if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, and sum you up so that they can stop listening and not really getting to know who the real you of who you are, because you are so much more than that. And most people actually, I know, tend to have more than one facet of their life that they are very passionate about. So when you're in that 5D realm and you're wanting to create a new you, a new improved version of you, you can be any combination and all of those things and even more. You get to decide what it is that you want to create for you and yourself so that then you show up in the world in that realm. If our thoughts can make us sick, can they make us well? Let's go one step further. I explained earlier that we can turn on the stress response by thought alone. I also mentioned that scientific fact that the chemicals associated with stress pull the genetic trigger by creating a very harsh environment outside of our cells and thus creating disease. So by pure reason, our thoughts can actually make us sick. If our thoughts can make us sick, might they also make us well? Let's say that a person had some experiences within a short frame of time that caused him to feel resentful. As a result of this, his unconscious reactions to those occurrences, he held on to his bitterness. Chemicals responding to this emotion flooded his cells. Over weeks, his emotion turned into a mood, which continued for months and changed into a temperament, which was sustained for years and formed a strong personality trait called resentment. In fact, he memorized this emotion so well that his body knew resentment better than the conscious mind because he remained in a cycle of thinking and feeling, feeling and thinking that way for years. I've known people like that. Based on what you learned about emotions as the chemical signature of an experience, wouldn't you agree that as long as this person clings to resentment, his body will react as though it is still representing and still experiencing the long ago events that first caused him to embrace this emotion? Moreover, if the body's reaction to those chemicals of resentment disrupted the function of certain genes, and this sustained reaction kept signaling the same genes to respond in the same way, might the body eventually develop a physical condition such as cancer? Hmm. 
If so, is it possible that once he memorized the emotion of continuous resentment by no longer thinking the thoughts that created the feelings of resentment and vice versa, his body as the unconscious mind would be free from the emotional enslavement? Hmm. In time, would he stop signaling the genes the same way? And finally, let's say he began thinking and feeling in new ways to such a degree that he invented a new ideal of himself related to a new personality. As he moved into a new state of being, might he signal his genes in beneficial ways and condition the body into an elevated emotional state ahead of the actual experience of good health? Could he do this to the extent that the body would begin to change by thought alone? What I just described in simple terms happened to a student in one of my seminars who overcame cancer. Bill, 57, was a roofing contractor. A lesion had appeared on his face and a dermatologist diagnosed it as malignant melanoma. Although Bill underwent surgery, radiation and chemotherapy, cancer reoccurred in his neck, then his side, and finally his calf. Each time he underwent a similar course of treatment. Bill naturally exp experienced whiny moments. He understood that his excessive sun exposure was a risk factor, but he knew others who had been similarly exposed and didn't develop cancer. He fixated on the unfairness. So after treatment for the same cancer on his left flank, Bill pondered whether his own thoughts, emotions, and or behaviors had contributed to the condition. In a moment of self-reflection, he realized that for more than 30 years, he had been stuck in resentment thinking and feeling that he had always had to give up what he wanted for the sake of others. Wow, that's a big victim script. So for example, he had wanted to become a professional musician after high school, but when an injury left his father unable to work, Bill had to join his family's roofing company. He habitually re-experienced his feelings upon being told he had to give up his aspirations to the extent that his body still lived in the past. This also set up a pattern of dreams deferred. Whenever something didn't go his way, such as the housing market collapsing just after he expanded the business, he always found someone or something to blame. Bill had so memorized the emotional response pattern of bitterness that it dominated his personality and became an unconscious program. And his state of being had signaled the same genes for so long that they had created the disease that now afflicted him. No longer could Bill allow his environment to control him. The people, places, and influences in his life had always dictated how he thought, felt, and behaved. So he sensed that to break the bonds with his old self and reinvent a new one, he would have to leave his familiar environment. So for two weeks in Baja, Mexico, he retreated from his familiar life. The first five mornings, Bill contemplated how he thought when he felt resentment and he became a quantum observer of his thoughts and feelings and he became conscious of his unconscious mind. Next, he paid attention to his previously unconscious behaviors and actions. Thoughts, behaviors, and actions. He decided to halt any thought, behavior, or emotion that was unloving toward himself. Pause button. That's exactly what I decided to do when I was in Cancun. I had that profound mo moment of aha where I distinguished my connection to the divine, my awareness of my true loving self as opposed to my brain and my ego. And I thought, no, no more. No more. The distinction became so crystal clear. Thank God. It really was a profound, lucid moment, the moment I had that awareness. So after the first week of this vigilance, Bill felt free because he had liberated his body from its emotional addiction to resentment. And by inhibiting the familiar thoughts and feelings that had driven his behaviors, in a sense, he impeded the signals of the survival emotions from conditioning his body to the same mind. And his body then released energy, which was available to use 
to design a new destiny for himself. For the next week, Bill became so uplifted that he thought about the new self he wanted to be and how he would respond to the people, places, and influences that previously controlled him. For instance, he decided that whenever his wife and kids expressed a wish or a need, he would respond with kindness and generosity instead of making them feel like a burden. In short, he focused on how he wanted to think, act, and feel when presented with situations that had challenged him in the past. He was creating a new personality, a new mind, and a new state of being. Bill began to put into practice what he'd place in his mind while sitting on the Baja bench. Shortly after his return, he noticed that the tumor on his calf had fallen off. In a week or so, when he went to his doctor, he was cancer free. He has remained that way. By firing his brain in new ways, Bill changed biologically and chemically from his previous self. As a result, he signaled new genes in new ways and those cancer cells couldn't coexist within his new mind, new internal chemistry and new self. Once trapped by the emotions of the past, he now lives in a new future. I would say in a new free future. Next section is creation, creation, living as a nobody. At the end of the previous chapter, I briefly described what it is like to live in a creative mode. Those are the moments of being fully engaged and in a flow so that the environment of the body and time all seem immaterial and don't invade our conscious thoughts. So living in creation is living as a nobody. Ever notice that when you're truly in the midst of creating anything, you forget about yourself? You disassociate from your known world. You are no longer a somebody who associates with your identity with certain things you own, particular people you know, certain tasks you do, and different places you've lived at specific times. You could say that when you are in a creative state, you forget about the habit of being you. You lay down your selfish ego and become selfless. You have moved beyond time and space and become pure immaterial awareness. Once you're no longer connected to a body, no longer focus on people, places, or things in your external environment and beyond linear time, you're entering the door of the quantum field. You cannot enter as a somebody. You must do so as a nobody. You have to leave the self-centered ego at the door and enter the realm of consciousness as pure consciousness. And as, a, as I said in chapter one, in order to change your body to foster better health, somebody or something in your external circumstance, a new job or relationship perhaps, or your timeline towards a possible future reality, you have to become nobody, no thing in no time. So thus, here is the grand hint. To change any aspect of your life, body, environment, or time, you must transcend it. You must leave behind the big three in order to control the big three. I'm gonna say that again. Here is the grand hint. I'm gonna repeat this, this is second time. Write this down. To change any aspect of your life, body, environment, or time, you must transcend it. You must leave behind the big three in order to control the big three. There lies the paradox. It's like a juxtaposition where in order to gain control of it, you have to let it go. And in letting it go, you have all the control in the world now. The frontal lobe, domain of creation and change. When we are in creation, we are activating the brain's creative center. The frontal lobe, part of the forebrain and compromising the prefrontal cortex. This is the newest, most evolved part of our human nervous system and the most adaptable part of the brain. It tends to be the creative center of who we are and the brain's CEO or decision-making apparatus. 
The frontal lobe is the seat of our attention. Focus, concentration, awareness, observation, and consciousness. It is where we speculate on possibilities, demonstrate firm intention, make conscious decisions, control impulsive and emotional behaviors, and learn new things. So for the sake of understanding, the frontal lobe performs three essential functions. These will all come into play as you learn and practice the how-to meditative steps for breaking the habit of being yourself in part three of this book, Metacognition. For the sake of our understanding, the frontal lobe performs three essential functions. These will all come into play as you learn and practice the how-to meditative steps for breaking the habit of becoming yourself in part three of this book, Metacognition. Becoming self-aware to inhibit unwanted states of mind and body. If you want to create a new self, you first have to stop being the old self. In the process of creation, the first function of the frontal lobe is to become more self-aware. Because we have metacognitive capabilities, the power to observe our own thoughts and self, we can decide how we no longer want to be, to think, act, and feel. This ability to self-reflect allows us to scrutinize ourselves and then make a plan to modify our behaviors so we can produce more enlightened or desirable outcomes. Your attention is where you place your energy. So to use your attention to empower your life, you will have to examine what you've already created. This is where you begin to know thyself. You look at your beliefs about life, yourself, and others. You are what you are, you are where you are, and you are who you are because of what you believe about yourself. Your beliefs are the thoughts you keep consciously or unconsciously accepting as the law in your life. Whether you are aware of them or not, they're still affecting your reality. So if you truly want a new personal reality, start observing all the aspects of your present personality. Since they primarily operate below the level of conscious awareness, much like automatic software programs, you'll have to go within and look at these elements you probably haven't even been aware of before. Given your own personality compromises, how you think, act, and feel, you must pay attention to your unconscious thoughts, reflexive behaviors, and automatic emotional reactions. Put them under observation to determine if they are true and whether you want to continue to endorse them with your energy, to become familiar with your unconscious states of mind and body, take an act of will, intention, and heightened awareness. If you become more aware, you will become more attentive. If you become more attentive, you will be more conscious. If you grow to be more conscious, you will notice more. If you notice more, you have a greater ability to observe self and others. So both inner and outer elements of your reality. Ultimately, the more you observe, the more you awaken from the state of conscious mind into the conscious awareness. So the purpose of becoming self-aware is so that you no longer allow any thought, action, or emotion you don't want to experience to pass by your awareness. Thus, in time, your ability to consciously inhibit those states of being will stop and the same firing and wiring of old neural networks that are related to the old personality. And as a result of no longer creating the same mind on a daily basis, you prune away the hardware that is related to the old self. In addition, by interrupting the feelings that are associated with those thoughts, you are no longer signaling genes in the same way. You are stopping the body from reaffirming itself as the same mind. This process is whereby you quite simply begin to lose your mind. So as you develop the skill of becoming familiar with all aspects of your old self, you will ultimately become more conscious. Your goal here is to unlearn who you used to be so that you can free up energy to create a new life, a new personality. You can't create a new personal reality as the same personality. You have to become someone else. Metacognition is your first task in moving away and moving from your past to creating a new future. Two, creating a new mind to think about new ways of being. The second function of the frontal lobe is to create a new mind to break out of the neural networks 
creating a new mind to think about new ways of being. The second function of the frontal lobe is to create a new mind, to break out of the neural networks produced by the ways that your brain has been firing for years on end and influence it to rewire in new ways. When we set aside time and private space to think about a new way of being, that is when the frontal lobe engages in creation. We can imagine fresh possibilities and ask ourselves important questions about what we really want how and who we want to be, and what we want to change about ourselves and our circumstances. Because the frontal lobe has connections to all other parts of the brain, it is able to scan across all the neural circuits to seamlessly piece together stored bits of information in the form of networks, of knowledge and experience. Then it picks and chooses among those neural circuits, combining them in a variety of ways to create a new mind. In doing that, it creates a model or internal representation that we see as a picture of our intended result. It makes sense then that the more knowledge we have, the greater the variety of neural networks we've wired, and the more capable we are of dreaming of more complex and detailed models. To initiate this step of creation, it is always good to move into a state of wonder, contemplation, possibility, reflection, or speculation by asking yourself some important questions. Open-ended inquiries are the most provocative approach to producing a fluent stream of consciousness. What would it be like to? What is a better way to be? What if I was this person living in this reality? Who in history do I admire? And what were his or her admirable traits? The answers that come will naturally form a new mind. Because as you sincerely respond to them, your brain will begin to work in new ways. So by beginning to mentally rehearse new ways of being, you start rewiring yourself neurologically to a new mind. And the more you can remind yourself, the more you'll change your brain and your life. So whether you want to be wealthy or a better parent or a great wizard, for that matter, it might not be a bad idea to fill your brain with knowledge on your chosen subject so you have more building blocks to make a new model of reality you want to embrace. Every time you acquire information, you're adding a new synaptic connection that will serve as the raw materials to break your pattern of your brain firing the same way. The more you learn, the more ammo you have to unseat your old personality.